We may be trapped on this world that's on the brink of mass extinction, plagued by a species that destroys the environment, but while we're here, breathing in the disgusting poison, air, at least we have each other.
welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you would be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Jan Selmy. I'm a, a writer and musician, a drummer, <laughs> mostly. And how would people have heard your drumming? What bands have you been in? So I was in, in the company of Serpents, a doom band from Denver, me and my good friend Grant started the band, and I ended up moving away to go to grad school not long after, but, you know, made sure that we always stayed really solid friends. And I actually helped him. When I knew that I was moving away from school, I kind of helped him look for drummers and helped him uh, do some recruiting. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's all love there for sure. And then I lived in Central California for a while, and then me and my wife moved to uh, Minneapolis for a couple of years and out there I played in a band called Former Worlds and we I recorded drums for the full length record we released one EP in 2016 I think I'm not, I can't remember for sure and I ended up recording drums for a full length record in December of 2017 and that was right before I moved to where I currently am and Southern California. Now I play in a band called Drainage that I love a lot. Yeah, I feel lucky to uh, to be you know being a band with such talented musicians as Drainage, and then also just over the years, one of the cool things I really take from being in bands is just the opportunity to have really close friendships where you you know, share this kind of creative output that you all care about a lot. It's a, it's a cool bond to have for sure. And as you mentioned, you're also a music writer. Uh, tell people where they may have seen your work. So my second book just came out in February. It's called Doom to Fail, the incredibly loud history of doom, sludge, and post-metal. There are a couple of excerpts that one up in like one in revolver and then one in decibel and then i've also just written about heavy music for for quite a while i guess in different outlets like av club and vibe and so people might know some of my writing from there and then before i really well i guess i've been writing about music for a pretty long time but my first book is more of a narrative. It's called Heavy, a memoir of Wyoming BMX, drugs, and heavy fucking music. Actually, I think I fucked up the order of my own book. That's pretty bad. No, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's more of a narrative that kind of that came out in 2016. So there's obviously you know a lot of material in there about being a young metalhead and. I guess it's kind of like a metalhead's coming of age story in a lot of ways. It's also a lot about growing up in coal mining town, rural, uh, rural America. So I definitely want to talk to you about your books. Listeners of the podcast will be familiar with In the Company of Serpents because I, I talked to Grant a few weeks back and they were featured a, a very recent episode. So we don't necessarily need to go into... The history of of in the company of serpents and and how you've helped form the band but i am i am curious about your own personal music history because you know you're someone who who's been involved with these these doom metal and sludge metal bands and has been writing professionally about music and has written a book about doom metal so what what brought you to that point how did you get involved with with heavy music and why do you have a personal affinity for, you know, the slowest, heaviest kind of music? Yeah, when I was in high school, well, I started playing drums when I was about 12 and uh, didn't get really serious about it until after high school. But I definitely always, you know, played throughout the years. And um, when I was about 15 or 16, I discovered old metallica and slayer and pantera and so just got super heavy into thrash and it was easily you know my favorite music at the time and i always loved black sabbath too but like pantera especially became one of my 
favorite all those bands metallica slayer and panther i really love all those bands and still do and i always wanted so badly to be able to play drums like those guys like lars back in the day and then dave lombardo and vinnie paul and you know it's very dexterous athletic drumming just insanely fast double bass and i used to sit in my parents basement and just try to play double bass grooves and it just never worked i could never really get it up to speed i i could never do anything solid and so from there like i said i always loved sabbath i started getting into uh, like sleep and i hate god and floor in that music it, it it really felt like kind of an invitation to me because i couldn't play super fast double bass but i still wanted to play metal and in some form and so when i discovered that type of stuff it really became close to my heart because it was like a you know it was an invitation to play music is really how i saw it and one of the things that i still really love about that music and so from there yeah it's and you know playing really slow is also much easier said than done when it you know takes takes a lot of time and practice to be able to stay in time and play heavy and also one thing i got really into over the years is like with drummers like uh joey lacaz from i hate god or kiko from weed eater they have this really it's this is this really huge fat feel it feels like the notes are just really really big and it makes the music feel that much bigger and so i kind of they and Dale Krober from Melvin's does the same thing. A ton of great heavy drummers do it. It was actually a jazz drummer I was I was talking to her and she she kind of introduced me to the concept of like playing the front end of the beat or like kind of the back end of it. And it's it's like only you know a millisecond if that difference, but it really makes all the difference in the world of how the music feels and so I just really started to get into kind of that that feel and trying to develop it on my own. And I feel like where I first started to do that was when I moved away from my small town because I always did want to start heavy bands when I was in high school. went from a, a small town in Wyoming called Rock Springs. And there's only a handful of metalheads who were super, super into a lot of the metal that I was into. And so trying to find a somebody who wanted to be in a doom band there was it, it just wasn't going to happen there was no way and so when i moved away to uh, denver i started being bands and you know taking it more seriously and um, i was in a band called Gestera that was a lot of fun and then one called Sherman to the fucking sea which is more kind of a, like mid 90s like noisy metalcore kind of like kiss a goodbye and both of those bands as with pretty much every band i've ever been in has just been great opportunities to play with people who i feel like are oftentimes kind of beyond my skill level and so i guess it's like a really long way to circle back to your question i've been lucky lucky enough to find bands with just super talented musicians and and like i said honestly people who are a couple notches if not more ahead of me which is definitely the case with drainage too and it's just such a great way to learn and grow and and i've really gained so much of what i know about drumming and playing drums in a heavy band from just playing playing with yeah like i said really good guitarists and i've been lucky to play with multiple guitarists who also know how to play the drums and so that, that was really like super illuminating which is it just happens to be the case with drainage to ricky the guitarist is also a super talented drummer and so he has a really like rhythmic way of writing songs and understanding parts and stuff which is really awesome and pushes me in this cool way so you mentioned having a hard time finding people who were who shared your your interest and your passion for the slower heavier type of bands I, I think and we're going to talk more about the history when we talk about the book but people people should recognize or or be aware of the fact that throughout most of 
you know, the 80s and 90s, slower, heavier kind of bands were really on the periphery of the heavy music scene. First of all, there weren't many of them. The ones that were fairly prominent were almost almost on the periphery of, of the metal scene to the point where for people who wanted to play slower music, there was almost like a shared space between noise rock bands, metal bands, and you know hardcore bands who had started to slow down a bit. And it, it was only really like at the tail end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s where we had this kind of doom metal and sludge metal renaissance where that kind of music became much more prominent and popular. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny because, I mean, Black Sabbath is not only the first doom band, but the first heavy metal band. It's a, you know, argument that we all know and I think still holds up in a lot of ways. You can point to other other bands like Coven especially. There was there was like the idea of metal, I think, when Black Sabbath started. There was like the idea of like kind of creepy aesthetics and trying to shock people a little bit and scare them. But as far as actually doing that with just the sound and the music itself, I think Black Sabbath was just on its whole a whole different planet in a lot of ways. And so I mean, metal started at its very roots. It's it's that slow, super heavy. Um, I mean, the first song off the first Black Sabbath record is one of the heaviest they ever wrote. And, and I would really argue one of the heaviest songs of all time. But then, yeah, like you said, it, it just... From there, there was just a couple bands who popped up over the years who wanted to kind of revive that, that sound, but... You know, once once the kind of new wave of Brit- British heavy metal hit with Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, the speed trajectory was just, you know, just really shot up. But yeah, it's it's interesting to read about some of those older bands and before Doom was like a widely known thing and just how like how much it would catch people off guard. It's pretty funny. One of my favorite stories from those earlier years is how a uh, black flag would take St. Vitus on tour with them. And essentially is like, you know, it started out as like kind of a troll. It's just kind of a joke because of black fat, <laughs> black flag. I mean, I think black flag themselves loved St. Vitus, but they knew their fans would just, it would just make people, it would just drive them insane, especially for that hardcore audience when, it, it, it was, you know, definitely like just faster, faster, faster. And so here's a band that's just way, way slower. And also the guys in St. Vitus are, you know, not not hardcore kids at all. They're just like these really gnarly, like very genuine metal dudes. And so I love those old stories of Black Flag taking them on a tour and people just getting completely pissed. They would throw bottles at them and spit at them and essentially try to get them off every night. And St. Vitus just wouldn't back down. And after a couple, you know, a a couple uh, rotations on whatever tour circuits they were doing, um, eventually those fans just, they're, you know, they, they realized that you couldn't fuck with this band. They weren't going to go anywhere. And I think it, earn them this kind of credibility and so they i think that kind of spirit is in in doom in a lot of ways even when it's been like unpopular and just at its very earliest with like candle mass and trouble and pentagram and saint vitus during when people didn't quite know what to make of it or like you said when it was really on the periphery i think there was always going to be these sort of diehard fans and people who really connect with the spirit of the music. And it's, it's been cool to, you know, see while in, in my lifetime and especially like when I was really coming into my own as, as a musician and listener, seeing doom really blow up and see how many good bands came out of it and how, how much good stuff there is out there right now. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, for most of the the '90s, there wasn't really like a, and, and maybe you would know more about this than than I do, 
but there wasn't really like a quote unquote doom metal scene. And so you'd have bands like Cathedral, Sleep, Confessor being released on what was essentially a death metal and grindcore label. You know, just because it was it was another type of underground metal music. And credit to to Dig from Eric for, for recognizing the the quality and the, the importance of these bands. But I, I very vividly remember, you know, my friends who were from that extreme metal, you know, death metal, black metal side of things, not liking Cathedral and not liking Sleep and, you know, not knowing why these bands were were on compilations with At The Gates and Napalm Death and, and whoever else. So you mentioned the, the trolling aesthetic and Black Flag bringing on St. Vitus on, on their tours. I, I think this impulse to, to troll their own audience and to almost antagonize their own audience is, is, is a recurring theme within the, the realm of, of doom metal and, and sludge metal. You know, you've got bands that came from more of a, a punk and a hardcore background who, you know, when the prevailing aesthetic was to play as fast as possible, would play these like slow, monotonous, you know, seemingly never ending songs you know, to the disdain of, of their fans who just wanted to get drunk and, and mosh. And, you know, it's, it's something that you you see with Black Flag. It's something that you see with the Melvins. Even a band like Trouble, who, you know, in their own right are a fairly, fairly well-respected and, and well-loved band within the metal scene. But, you know, when they would be paired up with a thrash metal band like Slayer, it, the entire audience would turn on them, you know, to the point where it was, it was a near riot. So it it almost seems like th- th- there are two things going on. Like one is the, the slow music as a way of you know punishing the audience <laughs> who who would really just do anything for for a fast part at that point. But to to borrow a, a phrase from from Black Flag, you know, th- this is the process of weeding out because the people who stick around and listen to your eight minute sludgy doom hardcore jam are the people who get it. Are, are the people who are really interested in music or have a wider knowledge or perspective on music than maybe, you know, the mosh bros and, you know, the kids who just showed up because it's something to do on a Friday night? Yeah. Yeah, and I think I've had plenty of musical experiences where I, I think it's it's really good to be, like, confused or caught off guard or even, you know, with metal to have something that kind of it just maybe catches you off guard and irritates you in some way. And then to really like step back and try to understand that thing, I think to me is can be like really, really, really fruitful. I feel like doom and sludge when I, when I first heard it, I, I kind of got it on some instinctual level. I'm not exactly sure why, but Part of it was like hearing it in like BMX videos, and so I, I feel like I just the spirit of it really came across. And and again, like I said, it was that kind of invitation thing of you know like I could play this really gnarly heavy music too. But yeah, for for me it was grindcore. It took me like quite a while, or maybe not quite a while. I just didn't really give it a chance until I was out of high school, and somebody kind of like it was when I really started to understand like some of the differences between like grindcore and death metal and what they're trying to do with grindcore and power violence. And what like kind of initially seemed to me as just like a joke and these ridiculous sounds I ended up getting super, super into and could like really, really respect where it was coming from and developed this huge appreciation for napalm death and pig destroyer and power violence bands like spaz and combat wounded veteran and stuff like that and so yeah i think that that place of like one music confuses you or you know presses those buttons it's a really good opportunity to step back and like try to figure out what's going on especially when it comes to metal and hardcore when like you said i think it at the basis of the music anyway it's like there's a, an antagonistic bent to all of it. And, and, you know, it's, it's definitely not easy listening on the radio. It's, it's way more gnarlier and aggressive and 
just trying to get at something totally different. And so I think too, like the everyday, like pop music listener, all metal is very, very antagonistic. So to play like even to make it even more antagonistic within itself is to me, is just very, it's like very in the spirit of where the music came from. And, and yeah, I really like that, that example of black flag, I think is, is really awesome. And that antagonistic spirit, I think, now lives on so much in in sludge really and i mean that's where melvins were coming from when they first started playing stuff like that they were like you said hardcore kids and they essentially got sick of it and then just decided to play as slow and punishing as possible and it's funny because black flag one of the first hardcore bands really kind of like laid a lot of that groundwork with the b-side of of my war is like this weird, just slow, monotonous crawl, crawling hardcore. And then Melvin's just kind of took that to a different extreme. And then that trolling spirit, I hate God, you know, it, that's, that's at the core spirit of that band. They, they've taken it to some places that I don't really ag- agree with or, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's definitely at the heart of that band. That's for sure.
I mean, to tag on to, to something that you said about Grindcore, Grindcore and Doom Metal have a very strange intertwined history because it was one of the, the early members of Napalm Death who formed Cathedral and also one of the first record labels dedicated entirely to Doom Metal. And I think if you look at a lot of sludge bands, like Grief is the band that, that comes most to my mind, but a lot of sludge bands uh, came from this this kind of grindcore background where after after spending a period of time antagonizing people in one direction, they decided to switch gears and, and go in the other direction and antagonize them with like slow, heavy, feedback-drenched sludge. Yeah, yeah, and some of those... Some of those early shows, I I feel like, I guess, yeah. The one of, I I love to see mixed bills because they I definitely can, you know I just love for people to mix it up and so when I hear of those some of those early shows like you mentioned like, grief or, cavity playing with, spaz and all these crazy grindcore and power violence bands and Nuth Crush would do that a lot too and they would also put out splits with those bands to me is is really awesome because i i just love that kind of mixing it up it it makes you when you see a really fast band and then a doom band right next to it it makes i think it really highlights the strengths of of both bands and you can really see how gnarly they are so just because doom metal has this this kind of reputation and you know one of the associated genres or spin-off genres of, of doom metal is actually stoner metal how much how much of the appeal of of these kind of slow heavy bands is drugs <laughs> and the type of drugs that people were using it, it's funny because i i got into the music way before i ever smoked weed i was a, a straight edge kid growing up and throughout high school and so yeah me and my friends didn't drink or party at all and really kind of have like a you know we were kind of stereotypical straight edge kids and we just had kind of a i don't know i guess snobby attitude (laughs) in a lot of ways but the i got into the music way before i ever knew i i guess i smoked weed once when i was 12 and got drunk and then decided that it wasn't for me (laughs) <laughs> at the wise age of 12 but when i first started to get into doom and sludge it was really before my years of like heavy drinking and pot smoke and doing different drugs and stuff but i yeah i think there's there's something about for me like the way when i would smoke uh weed i could like concentrate and sort of like shut out the rest of the world and just like just listen to a record which I haven't smoked in a really long time, but that's, you know, that's one of the things that I've, you know, that's probably some of my fondest memories of listening to records and getting high because there's something about that, that like I can't, if I'm, you know, in my daily life now, I don't just sit, sit down and listen to a record in its entirety, but weed would like open that Avenue for whatever reason. And so I think it does, it maybe makes you, can can make you a little bit more of a patient listener and there is definitely something about being high and just kind of like feeling the sounds consume you on a different level but all that said i i really only smoked weed for um like two years and um, had some other drug misadventures and uh I've been sober for almost 14 years now, and I still love heavy music just as much as I ever have, and I've gotten way better at playing it, being sober. And so I think, yeah, there is that there's that appeal for sure, but I think it's also not necessarily limited, but maybe, maybe it does have to do with the patience aspect because I can see weed as being like a good tool to really make you like slow down and kind of shut things off and so that that could be a good mental state to just really dig into a riff or a sound or a vibe which is you know so much of what of what doom and sludge is trying to do is just really create this all-consuming vibe yeah i mean as somebody who's who's never done drugs and you know i don't have much of an experience with getting stoned and listening to sleep or whatever 
but it does seem to me like you know the state of mind in which you play a riff endlessly for 10 minutes would probably be helped along by <laughs> some some kind of substances yeah that's for sure i will say yeah we kind of like changed my perception of music in a lot of ways and it was really sweet to listen to sleep and like bongzilla and stuff like that while stoned it's just you know it just really fun and maybe kind of cliche but d- yeah there's no denying that it's fun but yeah i think maybe more than weed lsd really gave me a different kind of understanding of music and really made your like layers of music in a different way and i remember really that some of the first times that really happened was with mastodon and so i would never when people describe them as a sludge band or like sludge metal i always get kind of confused because they just seem you know i mean there's definitely sludgy elements especially in like the earlier stuff but it's also like very grindy and crusty and just like straight up metal kind of so yeah i think you know to circle back again drugs can be a really great way to like yeah understand music or give you different appreciation and then I think from Mastodon was really like the stepping stone into me understanding like Isis and Neurosis and really getting into those sounds. And so I think drugs were a catalyst for sure. But then later when I had my most intense listening experiences to like Neurosis, for example, it was completely sober. And so I think one of the cool things heavy music can do is that there's something about that repetition too, that even if you're sober, it can kind of create this weird altered state. And yeah, that's just a really awesome, insane thing that music can do. It's just, it can alter your brain. And sometimes it's, it, it can happen in these really extreme ways. Like with Sun, I remember seeing them again sober. And just after a while, I felt like I was just, it made me feel like I was tripping on acid again. Everything was just like started looking really strange around me. And it, it was insane to me that just sound had, had really altered my perception in this way. Let's jump into the book. As you mentioned, it's called Doom to Fail, the incredibly loud history of doom, sludge, and post-metal. Everyone listening to this podcast will be familiar with those terms. But I'm curious how you how you draw the distinction between a doom metal band, a sludge metal band, and a post metal band. Yeah, that was one of the you know hard questions of the book, and I think really before I started writing, well, I shouldn't say, but there there definitely was a point like earlier on as a listener when. I I was definitely, like, one of the people who would say, like, oh, Doom, Sludge, and, like, Post Metal, like, it's just all, like, slow metal, and I I can see, like, why you would make the distinctions, but really, like, if if it's good, it's good, and then, you know, realize it's all slow metal, but as I kind of, like, set out to write the history of Doom Metal, trying to, like, lump in Melvin's and I Hate God and Grief, it just, the more I looked at it, I, I could see more clearly that it was just coming from a, a different place. And so the the kind of definitions that I came upon, and I'm definitely not the only person to think of them this way, but to me, a lot of the doom stuff, and you can trace this black, back to Black Sabbath, there's this kind of like reaching towards some kind of, some kind of like larger spiritual truth or understanding or some kind of maybe a light enlightenment or something like that. But a lot of doom I think is kind of has that spiritual bent to where there's this attempt to reach something larger. And so black Sabbath, I think we're doing that. And then pentagram and, you know, on later into trouble, who was a straight up Christian band. But, you know, if you, if you just listen to trouble without having any context or knowing anything about the band, I think, you know, most people would probably be surprised that they're a Christian band because it doesn't sound at all like you would imagine Christian metal to sound like. 
and then on later toward Candlemass and and now onto like Bell Witch and Yob, I feel like these are all bands that I would firmly place under the Doom umbrella. And there's all this kind. Of, one of the big things they have in common is that kind of reaching toward spiritual truth for some in some way. And then in a lot of ways, when Melvins came out, it was kind of the opposite. It was coming straight from hardcore, and it was a lot more there's a lot more irony there which i hate god picked up on and a lot of it was more just grounded in in you know daily life and i think i hate god took that to an extreme and in this really interesting way where it was just way more about like social negativity and personal negativity and you know really intense drug addiction and just some of the most caustic emotions and kind of like human situations that are on earth essentially is where that stuff comes from. And so, I mean, yeah, it's like I said, it's, it's two very different places. And so I think there is a good, you know, there is a good reason to distinguish between doom and sludge in that way. And then, you know, at the same time, the way like people have pushed sludge now, bands like Indian and Primitive Man, I still would call them sludge at the end of the day, but, you know, it's it's it, it can get pretty hazy for sure as far as, like, what, you know, is this doom or is it sludge? And to me, a lot of it kind of comes back to, like, what the bands are trying to examine maybe in their lyrics or what's, what's their inspiration, what they're trying to get at. And then post-metal, I think commonly has been and i saw saw it this way too for a long time you know essentially music that follows in isis or neurosis's footprints of you know utilizing like very quiet to very loud to intensify impact and as i was thinking about the structure of the book and it probably comes from you know just going to school as an english major and kind of like studying postmodernism as just a art movement and like what that meant i started thinking more about like post metal in terms of it, like along those lines and so postmodernism really a lot of it seeks to like kind of upset tropes or like um, common ways of approaching art or common ways that art works and so i started thinking like a lot of the bands that i think are really interesting now are they, they just challenge, they use the spirit of metal in some weird way that's just completely unexpected and flips it on its head, head in a lot of ways. And so as far as the definition of post-metal in the book, that's, that's how I approached it is like slow music that is, you know, has some kind of deconstructive bent to it, basically. Can, can I give you my... <laughs> my pedantic somewhat reductive definition or distinction between doom metal and, and sludge metal yeah of course love to hear it <laughs> so I, I i think the background of the bands has a lot to do with it and you know realizing that a lot of sludge metal bands came from this kind of hardcore or punk rock background i realized that a lot of sludge metal bands or, or sludge metal songs really just sound like hardcore songs slowed down you know 300 400 percent and you know to me like a doom metal band will write riffs and a sludge metal band will will play chord progressions except both incredibly downtuned and distorted but i think the approach and the background of of the two genres is is somewhat distinct and of course there's a lot of there, there's a lot of overlap and you know things bleed into each other to the extent where are, are sleep a sludge metal band or are they a doom metal band? You know, that's they do they do a little bit of both, but I think like in terms of if I see somebody with a uh, <laughs> with a a grief or a dystopia T-shirt, you know, I'm pretty sure that they they came more from like the punk rock or hardcore side, and if I see somebody with a I don't know like a trouble or uh, I don't know like a down T-shirt, you know, probably that they were Hesher growing up and, and gone into doom metal that way. Yeah, I think, you know, part of me kind of wondered, like, is it silly to distinguish between them? And there's, you know, plenty of musicians who, they get kind of sick of, like, music writers and 
<laughs> journalists like parsing the genres and trying to decide. But I, I think it's it's really a way of honoring, like you said, where the where the musicians are coming from because it is it is way different. And to me, it, I, I think it, to recognize that is is basically just appreciating the band on a different level. So let's talk about the writing of the book. How long had you been working on it? So I, let's see, it's kind of a, it's the very, very beginnings of it before I knew what it would turn into. And when I thought it would be a completely different book was in like summer of 2015. And I set out to write, I don't know if you know the, there's the music book series called uh, 33 and a third. I don't. Can you tell me what those are? Yeah, they're like these pocket-sized books, essentially, that are like deep dives into like one specific album. So there's there's one on Black Sabbath, Mass of Reality by John Darnielle. That's really amazing. It's about he. Most of them are like straightforward music journalism, but his is like this fictional account of a Hessian kid who. His, his parents put him in a mental institution and the book is him writing to the nurse about why he should get his Black Sabbath record back. And it, it's, it's like fucking amazing. It's some of the best music writing I've ever read. Um, but a lot of them are more, you know, just straightforward, like I said, music journalism. And so, yeah, I've loved those books for a long time. And the publisher opened up submissions and they want you to write this whole in-depth proposal that to me i did it twice i tried once with pantera the great southern trend kill and then the second time was with uh, i hate god dope sick and the proposal just the book proposal ended up being like 30 single space pages with like a they have you do a sample chapter and then like a table of contents and marketing plan and all this crazy shit to essentially make sure like your idea is solid and that it could be a full book. And so I did that on, I hate God and um, they didn't pick, pick it up, which is, you know, I was like pretty much expected because, you know, they get such a high volume of submissions. And so I, after that got denied, I had all this writing about, I hate God. And I knew that I wanted to write some kind of book length thing on, on metal, like specifically. Cause like I said, my first book, hits on it in a lot of ways, but it's also like a very narrative based book. And so I really wanted to focus, focus primarily on, on the music. And so from there, I, I, I started to wonder if maybe I should write a biography on, on I hate God. And I actually got a proposal for that together and then sending it to the band and they really, they didn't like it. And it, and in retrospect, I, I made a lot of kind of like rookie music journalist mistakes i wrote about their drug use in a way that was not really like tactful or respectful sorry in fairness it's very hard to talk about i hate god without talking about the drug use yeah for sure and so they didn't like that and then also i you know i have a, a complicated relationship with that band because you know they have they have a song called uh, white n-word and they've you know jimmy bauer had a confederate flag on his guitar forever and they would put confederate flags on their cabs at shows for a long time and all that stuff and they always said it was you know like ironic and in jest but like the really when i was like in my earlier 20s and in college i I just started to realize more and more that like you can't use that type of stuff in irony that it, it no matter what it's it's always incredibly damaging um especially to the you know to the people who are literally oppressed by those things and so and i've never been able to shake i hate god as being one of my favorite bands because you know they they essentially invited me into music and gave me the confidence as a drummer to really pursue heavy music and so i've had this really like you know kind of push-pull relationship with them forever and so the in, in a nutshell, if I was going to write an I Hate God biography, it wasn't going to be just a, you know, one-sided, like, they're the best band of all time. And, I, you know, it wouldn't have been just glorifying. And so I felt when I got the response back from the band, that was kind of ultimately more of the book 
if they have somebody write a book on them, they were looking for more like a standard rock biography that wouldn't really like delve into the negativity. And, you know, really me as a listener, I've questioned all tons of times whether I should even keep listening to them. And so in a nutshell, they didn't, they, they weren't into that idea. And so again, I, I knew I wanted to write a full length book about heavy music and then, I started thinking maybe I should write a the neurosis biography. And yeah, I, you know, I learned from the I Hate God mishap and wrote a much better proposal. And I had met um, two of those guys before. <clears throat> and um, Noah Landis, the keyboarder, was very nice about the rejection. He essentially told me that uh, if they have somebody do a neurosis biography, it'd be somebody who's essentially like been with the band as a friend kind of from the, you know, really early years, which makes total sense to me. And so after those two rejections, again, I knew I, I really wanted to write a full length book about metal. And so somewhere in that timeline, I, I read um, choosing death, Albert Mudrian's book about death metal and grindcore. And then I read Lords of chaos and American hardcore and kind of these genre histories. And then it just, hit me it was, it was just so obvious when i realized what i should do i was like oh yeah like idiot you should write the history of doom and sludge metal of course that's a book and then that really you know like once that idea was in place it was about three years to uh like from start to finish once i knew that's what the book was going to be it took a few years but you know like really long answer the idea was kind of percolating for really like oh yeah almost five years I, but yeah like i said once i realized i should i should be writing the history of doom and sludge it um took about three years to complete and it was still you know a, a huge undertaking but that gave me the opportunity a band biography really does hinge on like having band involvement unless it's like a bigger band like guns and roses or something like that where there's a ton of information out there but something like I Hate God and Neurosis, which are like pretty huge bands for underground metal. There's still like not nearly enough information out there to write a, a full biography. I, I don't think without band cooperation or at least a, a very good one. I don't know. Somebody could, I'm sure prove me wrong. So writing the full history of the genres basically like opened up the possibility of like, I could, I would reach out to bands and, hope they would be involved for interviews and be interested. But if they weren't, it also didn't really matter because I could still write a chapter on a band without necessarily having to interview everybody.
writing about the history of doom metal is somewhat complicated because it encompasses 50 years, you know, from the first Black Sabbath album to now. It starts with 60s psychedelic bands and, you know, the British blues explosion and bands like the New Yardbirds who came out from more of a garage rock kind of background. And then, you know, it it entwines with, with punk and hardcore throughout the 80s when bands like Flipper started playing very slow feedback drenched music and and at the same time you've got bands that are extremely important influential figures like earth and skullflower but who aren't necessarily metal bands even though i don't think the the genre could have progressed without them and you could even put a band like swans in in that in that category as well and so in taking this this huge body of work and this this enormous length of time, how how, were, how did you have to structure that? Like, how did you tackle such an enormous uh, period of time and so many different kinds of bands and uh, albums and, and things like that? I mean, I guess kind of I knew from the outset that I wanted to cover, you know, like you, like you said, I wanted to cover that that whole range because it's definitely all intertwined, but... It, it, it's it was hard to you know it can be like hard to link it like you said in in writing and in a narrative and especially like chronologically to me if I was to like cover from Black Sabbath all the way to like the body and Harvey Milk and Neurosis and like some of the weirder stuff one chronological piece there was just like so much back and forth and it would have just been really, really hard to trace. And part of what I wanted to do with the book too, is also like bring people in who aren't, who don't necessarily know that much about metal or, or heavy music. And so really kind of create a welcome mat in a sense, I guess. And so, yeah, like you said, it's, there's so much happening in those timelines and where all the different bands got their sounds are like very unique where you had, like you said, Melvin's and, and Flipper, you know, like coming from like a punk and hardcore background. And then you had somebody like Neurosis who was like similar at first, but then they started getting into this very weird, like spiritual subconscious space. And and again, it, it just feels like the music like branched out into something too different to like connect it all in one, you know, like one linear narrative that way. And so once I really thought of breaking it down into three subsections, that's when it really like became way easier for me. And so when I thought of just Doom, and then I could go back into some of the stuff you're talking about of like, you know, the British psychedelic rock and then the band Coven and even American blues and the birth of amplification. It was kind of an opportunity to tie all those things into like, essentially like everything that created the stage for black Sabbath to exist. And then from, you know, Sabbath onward is a lot easier to just trace other doom bands within one section and then dedicate an entirely other section to sludge, you know, one kind of like hardcore. It was like you said, hardcore kids and essentially like slowing down and playing the super antagonistic feedback, heavy music. And then in a post metal, when it became something different too, where there is a lot of that, there's some bands reaching towards spiritual truth, but it's also like just reimagining the spirit of heavy metal in a different way. And that's one of the reasons I started the post metal section with um, God Flesh is I feel like that was one of the really early bands to just after black sabbath and kind of like in the midst of sludge justin broderick and godflesh just really imagined what slow music could be in this totally different context while kind of keeping this like core spirit intact um and so yeah again the the long answer is it it was it was really tough and so i feel like there were two major realizations for me in writing the book the first was 
like struggling and knowing that I wanted to write a book about heavy metal and then finally realizing it should be the history of doom sludge and post metal. And then the second one was like trying to figure out like how the fuck do you write about all this stuff in one book? And then once I realized I, I should break it up into three different branches and trace each history that way, it, it became way easier and, and made a lot more sense. So in writing about the history of these genres, you actually dedicated chapters to bands that are often overlooked. There were a few uh, excerpts available online that I was able to read. When I think of the history of doom metal and sludge metal, I don't often think of a band like Harvey Milk or Cavity, who were you know great bands, nothing against those bands, but I think those bands tend to be overlooked if for no other reason than they haven't been maybe as prolific or as active as some of their peers, like I Hate God or Neurosis or Grief or anybody like that. Tell me what the what the process was for choosing the bands that you wrote about. So I really tried to... One of the like fun and also challenging parts of the book was like really looking at music in its context of when it came out and really trying to decide like some of the stuff that was really new and novel for its time that ended up having a big kind of outsized influence. And I feel like Cavity was, was one of those, was one of those bands and they were interesting too, because, you know, they were one of those early ones where they were on all these like grindcore and hardcore bills. And those guys come from playing in hardcore bands and so I feel like they had this really like outsized impact on like motivating people who are interested in punk and hardcore to play this very slow, torturous music. And they also did a lot to like kind of bring that punk energy to the stage and make their live shows unpredictable. But yeah, like you said, I think as a whole cavity hasn't necessarily gotten their due. And part of it is, yeah, they don't have, you know, they don't have the like huge insane discography as like some other bands and I know they did a lot of touring but to not to the extent of like I Hate God or something like that. But I still feel like that impact was there and kind of the 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 amount of bands they ended up influencing and again just like showing people that are into hardcore and punk, you know, what what you could do with slow music and still kind of keep that that antagonistic spirit intact. And then um, Harvey Milk, it was, they've just always seemed on like such a different plane than pretty much every other band, you know, like say for Neurosis and Sun or, you know, just a, a handful of these really, really genius bands that have taken heavy music to this place of, you know, just complete mastery. And again, uh, Harvey Milk hasn't necessarily gotten their due, but I think anybody who knows who knows those records, you know, it's hard to listen to it and come away thinking that it's it's not at the very least well done because the way they structure those albums and songs is is so deliberate and kind of artful, and and again, it it really showed a different path that heavy music could take, and so. A lot of the bands that I put in the book or like um, trying to focus on were bands that I felt like had that kind of impact or were like progressive in some way or, you know, took what people were doing at the time and pushed it in a different direction. Um, and it, it's kind of weird because I, you know, I'm I'm 34 and wasn't around for a lot of when that stuff was happening. And so I just have to do it through research and just listening to albums alongside each other trying to figure out like what bands influence what other bands and stuff like that and so yeah i really i tried my best to focus on bands that i feel like were doing something like novel in, in some you know it, in in a very broad sense but that that was kind of like the main criteria yeah your point about uh, the impact of certain bands is is well taken because 
you can think of a band, for example, Down. Down was a fairly popular band. You know, they were they released albums on major labels. But, you know, in terms of the history of doom metal, how impactful were they? You know, that's that's arguable. No, nothing to do with their quality, but it's just in, in terms of importance. You can debate how important yeah. Down was. But if you take a band like, let's say, some, somebody like Skullflower, who had a very limited reach, but if everybody who who heard that band went out and formed a drone metal band, it, you can basically trace the entire history of of drone metal back to like one or two people even if even if those those particular artists weren't necessarily that popular or that well known dan by the way dan is a really good example because i i love especially nola you know i once i like discovered sludge metal in high school and like kind of like heavier doom stuff man i've listened to nola easily hundreds and hundreds of times I, i've listened to that record so much and I, I fucking love it so much still and then yeah it was a good example of like you know when i really started to kind of like line up the different trajectories i was like man you know what by the time they did this like they're already kirk uh weinstein already had crowbar and jimmy bauer they already had i hate god and so like those sounds were we're in the air essentially, and then you know Nola or uh, Down, you know, did a lot to kind of really hone hone stuff like that in. And so I think some of that I have seen people, uh, specifically um, Electric Wizard. I, I've noticed some people uh, are kind of salty about me not <laughs> focusing on in that much depth, but that was really the where I, where I kind of came from. I put it alongside of a lot of stuff that was coming out at the time and i was like man sleep was kind of like doing this already like a lot of these ideas and then as far as like pushing into like the sludge and hardcore like i hate god was already a thing too and it's like man i don't know i think like people are kind of already doing this stuff but it's a tough question and like you said it's it's arguable and it's also like fun to just discuss one of my favorite things is exactly what we're doing just you know, m- avid metal fans is talking about <laughs> lineages and stuff like that. It's a blast, I think. And also, whenever you embark on a project like this, there's always going to be the one guy like, hey, man, you forgot Count Raven. The answer is always, well, you know, write your own book. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of tried to, like, joke around the very beginning of the last chapter. Starts off with a sentence that says something like, I know I didn't include that one heavy band you love like you know maybe i'll do it in the revision or like maybe you could write your own book and it's like half and jess would also like i think in the spirit of that music because it's again there's that thing in doom and sludge of oh just you know so many people like hear it for themselves and it's this kind of invitation and so that's really how i kind of wanted the book to function too uh one last thing to to say about down before we we move on you know i i personally don't feel strongly about that band one way or another and i know people have extreme reactions to phil and selmo because of certain things he's done or certain things he's been involved with but when when that first down album came out and those guys were doing interviews for the band i mean first of all you you mentioned this you know down was a doom metal supergroup before there was even really a doom metal scene crowbar i hate god even Corrosion of Conformity, to a certain extent, were doing very Sabbathy, slow, heavy music. And so, you know, they, they were a gateway to that kind of music in, in that sense and ahead of their time. Uh, but also, you know, the very first time I ever heard of St. Vitus or The Obsessed or Pentagram was in, in you know, Count Raven and, and really obscure 80s doom metal, things like that, was with an interview with Phil Anselmo, where, you know, he was name dropping all, all these bands. And, you know, you, you can you can always count on, on Phil to do some name dropping, but at the same time, like, these guys knew their lineage. Th- these guys knew, you know, everything that, that came out before them, and they were real fans of the genre. So, yeah, I give, I give down credit that way. Yeah, um, I, had, I had those same exact experiences reading those down interviews, and, 
like I said, I was a huge Pantera fan in high school. And so like once I knew Pantera and I loved Black Sabbath and I, was, I also loved uh, like Black Flag and stuff like that. And I remember seeing an I Hate God patch on, on Phil's shorts and a, a picture of Pantera playing live. And then later, in, like him wearing crowbar and I Hate God shirts in the um, I'm Broken video. And so, yeah, I, I, I took so much from from just that guy, like being a, a loudspeaker for heavy music. And yeah, like you said, he's, you know, it, he's, he's done some pretty, not pretty, some like really stupid and regrettable shit over the years. But I, th- I think that's, that's Phil Anselmo at his best for sure, is like him passing on that lineage. And he, he always knew, yeah, like with those down interviews or Pantera and stuff, he always knew like people like you and me would be looking looking at him really taking what he said seriously and he was totally right and he you know i think introduced a lot of people to some really rad music over the years What's next for you besides promoting this book what are you working on so right now i'm so delving back into uh, my hometown writing an oral history of of rock springs which is a place where i'm from and i really tried to capture that place in in writing like several times and i realized recently i think people's stories from there are really what make the history in a lot of ways really what makes it unique it's kind of like if you drive through it it seems like just another like interstate town in america where you know people stop to get gas and like people who work there you know there's coal mines and like this kind of harsh manual labor but once you start hearing people's stories from there about like suicide and drug use and the kind of like fatalistic outlook that seems pretty uh, prevalent there it, it starts to, to me, it, it seems like a very gnarly place. And so, like I said, I've been wanting to capture that in writing for a while. And I, I realized recently that an oral history of, of that town would be the way to do it. And so that's what I'm working on now. And as you mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast, you're still involved in music. Tell me a little bit about Drainage. Drainage started as Ricky... Isla Eisenacher. It started as his like solo project. Of you know he he really loves uh, like Godflesh and 
swans and like this really gnarly harsh industrial and so it started out as just him and he can play you know multiple instruments and so it started out as just him playing guitar and drums and doing samples and weird noise um he ended up making it a full band and he got denise pla the bassist and then they had a different drummer before i joined named shane and so when i moved to long beach i was very actively looking for a band and once i started talking to uh ricky and d it, it just you know it was kind of one of those things that just felt very natural that we would be friends and would be in a band and that's you know still really how it feels one of the things i love about drainage is that you know like we we write music together but we're also just really good friends and, and just enjoy hanging out in some capacity just kind of enjoy each other's presence so it's definitely like a you know kind of that there's a strong like kind of family and family vibe and sense of community and as far as the music it's you know there's the heavy kind of element which is you know a huge part of obviously like what i love some of our favorite bands are like floor and neurosis and i hate god but then we also all have this other side that really loves like early to mid 90s metalcore like coalesce and dead guy and rorschach and and stuff like that and so drainage is is like a way to like wed those two things which to me i've, I've wanted to do forever because as I kind of returned to sobriety in my in my early 20s or like right when I turned 21, one of the things that really like kept me on that path was listening to uh, like Converge and and Coalesce and and bands that had kind of like straight edge history or or, or ties in, in some way. And so Drainage is this really awesome opportunity where um, yeah, I get it. We get to combine all those things. And it just, you know, they had the band going before. And once I, like I said, once I met them, I was just like, oh, yeah, we're, you know, it's no question we're in a band together. So JJ's book, Doom to Fail, The Incredibly Loud History of Doom, Sludge, and Post Metal is out now. JJ, tell people how they can order this. So you can buy it, you know, online through all the major retailers. My recommendation would be bookshop.org. Right now they're donating, I'm not ex- exactly sure, they're donating uh, some of their proceeds to Indie Bookstores. So yeah, bookshop.org would be kind of where I would recommend ordering it from. But yeah, also, you know, just get it whatever uh, is, a, is a comfortable buying choice for you. But yeah, bookshop.org is uh, donating a lot toward Indie Bookstores and I think trying to do some work of, you know, keeping keeping those things keeping those um, places afloat when, uh, you know, there's so much uncertainty, especially on the economic side of economic side of our world. And if people want to follow you and your writing, how can they do that? Yeah. I'm on Twitter at JJ underscore and sell me. And then also um, Instagram, I think is just at JJ and sell me all one word. And then I also have my website, JJ and sell me.com with a bunch of you know links to buy Doom to Fail and the first book and there's some excerpts collected there and you know different like interviews and media and a bunch of other writing that I've done that is not connected to that that isn't in either of those books so yeah that, maybe that's the best one to hit up hit up my website so I'm going to put you on the spot if you had to pick the top 10 doom metal albums, what would they be? <laughs> Fuck. Oh, man. <laughs> nice. I appreciate the... Uh, as an interviewer myself, I appreciate the... Um, just the idea of putting somebody on the spot a little bit because uh, I think you get really good answers that way. So top 10, um, do you want me to put it in order? No, that's not necessary. Just, uh, you know, 10 albums that you think everyone should own or... I guess the... the the top of it is an easy choice because it always to me comes back to a black sabbath self-titled record you know again going back to what i was saying of like how i decided what bands and albums to put in the book was so much about context and what people were playing at the time and when you listen to 
other music at the time compared to Black Sabbath. It's it's just it's mind blowing to me. It's endlessly mind blowing, like how much heavier they were than anything else. Just like by far, far and away, like when that first song comes on, it's just like very clear mark in the sand of like music. Here's this different branch of where music is gonna go. So yeah, number one. Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. I'd probably put Paranoid as as number two, maybe. I think it's you know very similar. It came out so quickly afterward and had similar impact, and you know found Sabbath kind of like focusing the the aesthetic a little bit more. And then maybe the rest of them don't follow numbers so much. I'd definitely put Melvin's Gluey Pores treatments on there. Neurosis through Silver and Blood. So that's for I Hate God. I know, like, everybody, Take Is Needed for Pain is, is their, like, classic record, and it it is an amazing record, but I, I've always thought Dope Sick was, like, heavier and gnarlier and just kind of grimier and just very much like the spirit of I Hate God. So I put I Hate God Dope Sick on there, number five. Um, let's see. Um, I thought Bell Witch Mirror Reaper was, like, very mind-blowing recent Doom record, one 80-minute you know, long song. It's just completely punishing and the kind of how slow they play is just like if you try to play that slow and in time, you know, if anybody says that's easy, I I would not, you know, not trust that person that they have actually done it or like gave it and, you know, gave it its due time and really like sat it. So yeah, Bell Witch Mirror Reaper, I think that puts me at six. Probably Godflesh self-titled record. I'm um, not probably definitely Godflesh self-titled record. Even though again, it's I guess going along with the definition of Doom as you know Doom Sludge and Post Metal. I'll go with kind of the book framing. Godflesh. It's again it was so mind blowing for the time and also like the amount of bands that it influenced from Floor and Neurosis to Melvins and. You know, it was another one of those lines in the sand of just showing a, a, a totally different route that heavy music was going to take. Jeez. So let's see, 7, 8, 9, 10. I'm trying to think back to the, the book and some of the albums that I really focus on. Maybe Grief, Come to Grief, as like a you know, another sludge record that just really pushed it into this very torturous territory. I would say Earth. The Bees Made Honey and the Lion's Skull. This is this really interesting, you know, like atmospheric, very different take on heavy music that's also like very mellow and calming, I think is very interesting. And maybe like as a tie with that one, I'd put Earth 2 because I think those are like equally progressive for their times and coming from the same band. And it, it also like Earth 2 was the first life of Earth and then the bees made honey was kind of the is kind of the second life of earth and where they are now so i think that's where am i at is that eight i think so okay yeah i i like this challenge i'd maybe put the body no one deserves happiness this is another like very strange progressive record and very unexpected. Oh man, now I'm now I'm putting myself in now I'm painting myself in a corner. Actually, as much as I do love that record, I would I'd probably scratch it and uh, put uh, uh, maybe Isis Oceanic instead. It's kind of something that like pushed the the idea of like utilizing like you know very delicate quiet as a way to kind of emphasize heaviness. And then I would say Harvey Milk is another probably Peace and Goodwill Toward Men. I think I butchered that title actually as well. But uh, yeah, it's just a you know, very progressive, interesting record. And then maybe last, I'll say uh, Sun White One. Is this is very extreme piece of music that, you know, once again pushed heavy sounds into this place that really makes sense considering the spirit of the music, but no one had really done up to that point. So yeah, great, great question. That was a tough one. Thank you so much, AJ. Yeah, thanks so much, Adrian. It was great talking to you, man.